audio version and then I wanted it and I always even when I buy the audio version then I I later buy the Kindle version because I want to highlight it and so I went to buy the Kindle version on Sunday and it was still 2.99 and we checked this morning it's still 2.99 so yeah it's really nice but there's no rhyme or reason to that
Did you know you can support The Technology Show when you shop at Amazon.com? Become a friend of the show by starting your shopping at thetechnologyshow.com slash shop. It's Tuesday, December the 17th, 2013. Did you know you can support the technology show when you shop at Amazon.com? Become a friend of the show by starting your shopping at thetechnologyshow.com slash shop. It's Tuesday, December the 17th, 2013, live from the Technology Show Podcasting Hall, Rural Pick in South Carolina, little one little home with a basement, Tony's old bedroom, last show of the year. It I'm is. Matthew TG. I'm Heath Mulliken. And I'm Tony Casey. Welcome to the Technology Show in my old bedroom. Oh, a weekly dear. podcast featuring technology, theology, and everything in between. This is episode 230. Man. So like every 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 opening, Matthew, Matthew's got this new line. He kind of puts a new a nuance try, on you know, welcoming yeah. people Do to the best. studio here. And so it always throws me off a little bit. <laughs> uh, let's talk about... Uh, are some of the recommendations that we gave on a Christmas list. One of those yes. was the uh, Kindle Fire HDX. Yes. So they started something this week. Right. That um, if if you will pay twenty five percent up front today. Yep. Then um, they'll they'll spread out your other three payments, e- three equal payments, no finance charge, anything over no the interest. next ninety days. Yeah. And what it, whatever card you use to make that initial payment, you authorize Amazon through this deal. That every thirty days they're gonna they're gonna take out that that payment, and so, so you'll a, have it paid off just in time for it to be obsolete. And we link you to that, so uh, yeah. that's something you want to take advantage. And also of. Uh, the the Kindle e reader forty nine dollars today. Normally uh, six, sixty nine yep. and eighty nine, and and all good uh, all good products. And if you're gonna if you're gonna do that deal, well, you might as well go to the technology show.com slash shop and help us out. That's one way you can do it. If you use Google Chrome, you can search uh, for the Google Chrome extension, go into the apps or the, the Google Chrome app store or and it, type that URL right yeah, there. Yeah, right there. Oh, that's good, TG. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Tech, yeah. Look, Look at him. Right Tag that at, in. You are so talented. Look at him just, oh, that's awesome, T. <laughs> and again, we want to thank Zach Burnham for, for making yeah, that. Thanks, it has, Zach. It has just, uh, I think TG was telling me, we made $10 yesterday. Yeah, close uh, to it. Not quite, but just about. That's so, fantastic And you for could us. put us over. You know, if you, with your <laughs> gift, can. Uh, <laughs> so now, the, the purchase t- of the, the week. The purchase of the week the litter genie cat litter oh, disposal yes. system i have a pretty good guess who bought this well, but uh, we want to in our, in our <laughs> thank you and uh, you know the technology show is technology theology everything in between and we can help you keep your litter box clean so is the i mean the litter genie that's like the diaper genie for your cats i guess okay yeah i mean I, I'm not Bert. familiar with the litter genies, so I just couldn't tell you. I don't okay. know what it does. I have no idea. Either, but it must but... be magical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, not only do we appreciate that, another way that you can um, help our show out is uh, if you're looking for an effective way to get word out about your organization, business, or nonprofit, why not consider sponsoring an episode of The Technology Show? When you sponsor the show, we'll feature your brand right on the front page of our site as well as inside the episode that you've sponsored. This means that your investment literally lives on years after the week you sponsor. We think it's a great deal and would love to have you on board. For more details, point it out again there, TJ. You're doing such oh, yeah, a good yeah. job. Like Sorry. you're a hand model. Look yeah, at that. Right there right it right. is. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, just follow that link there, and you can get more. And details. we're excited this coming uh, this coming spring. We have our first sponsor. Right. We'll really start uh, coming on the show. You'll hear this episode brought to you by, and yeah, we're excited yeah. about and that. that. Could yeah. be you. It could. Yeah, very excited. All right, so today we want to welcome Michael Cusick. Michael Michael John Cusick is an ordained minister, spiritual director, and licensed professional counselor who's experienced the restoring touch of God in a deeply broken life and marriage. Having served in ministry for over 25 years, including youth and college ministry, Michael's passion is to connect life's broken realities with the reality of the gospel. In addition to leading retreats and equipping Christian organizations around the world, Michael currently serves as an adjunct professor at Denver Seminary. He holds an MA in Biblical Counseling from Colorado Christian University and an MA from the College of Education at the University of Denver. Michael lives with his wife Julian and two children in Littleton, Colorado, where he enjoys the Rocky Mountains and a host of other outdoor activities with friends and family members. Hey Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tony. Uh, so glad that you're taking time out to be with us. Um, so it was probably about 10 weeks ago, I was talking with a friend, and he told me about this, this crazy book uh, called Surfing for God. Um, had no idea what it was going to be about, and then he began to tell me a little bit, and right away it piqued my interest. Uh, I bought it. Um, and, you know, let's just, let's just start out, um, you know, in addition to being a book, that deals with sexual addiction and helping people experience healing and wholeness. This book's also about your own journey to healing and wholeness in, in this area of your life. So tell a little bit about your own story and maybe explain why you would publicly put yourself out there on such a delicate subject. Well, I was born and raised in Hawaii, and about six years ago I got my arm bit off by a shark. And <laughs> wait. I'm sorry. I was confused. That's Soul Surfer. That's that's another. <laughs> one. Sorry, I had to say that. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I was a sex addict, and three years into my marriage, uh, while I was in ministry, my double life was exposed. And ironically, at the same time, I was training to do pastoral counseling. And so, when my world uh, was crushed and came apart, and the training that I was experiencing happened at the same time. It gave me a really unique opportunity to step into uh, working with men primarily initially. And as I started to tell my own story, people would come out of the woodwork and start to say, hey, I've struggled with that too. Or people would come and talk to me. And eventually God opened the door for me to start working with pastors and ministers and leaders. And uh, now this is exclusively what I do through Restoring the Soul. Yeah, I want to say real quick to our listeners that we're going to give away a couple copies of this today, the Kindle edition of that. And so um, now I want to talk, turn to the guys here. What do they need to do to get registered Yeah, you got to get in the chat room and let us know. We're giving it away to our chat room listeners. So the technologyshow.com slash live, hop in there, let us know that you want in. And at the end of the show today, we'll be okay. granting those away. But then we'll also... Yeah. I believe give away some hard copies for people who are listening to this recorded. That's yeah. right. Yeah, Michael, you're sending us some hard copies, so we'll set those up as giveaways yeah. next week and understand that you have a PDF with questions that go along with the book as well that we'll send along with the Kindle editions of this book. Great. Um, Michael, one of the things you get into the book is the diminishing returns of pornography. Um, talk about the issue of tolerance, you know, seeking out scenes that are darker, they're edgier, even more abusive, and also get into the science behind it. Dopamine, uh, the neural pathways, which I, I'm very fascinated with that aspect of it. Talk about that uh, briefly. Well, there's, there's two aspects. As a rule, when we indulge in any kind of sin, there's always the potential for us to become enslaved and in bondage to it. And so uh, a lot of sin, especially sexual sin, is progressive, and it tends to decompensate. So just as people talk about marijuana as a gateway drug, uh, pornography can be a gateway into a lot of other things, and especially with those other things be, being easily accessible on the Internet, mm. uh, that's even more true. But on a brain and neurological level, Heath, tolerance happens when, because of the, the primary issue with why internet pornography is different from looking at magazines or videos, which were the form of porn I was exposed to when I was young, the internet allows for an unprecedented level of novelty. Mm. And the way that God created our brains is that our brains crave novelty. So 
we want to see different images, we want to hear different sounds, we, we want, if you're driving across certain parts of the country for hours at a time, and you know, Kansas, for example, if you huh. drive from Colorado back east, and it's the exact same, your brain kind of gets numbed over. If there's novelty, it keeps you stimulated, even at an alertness level. And so with pornography, a person can go on the internet and click image after image after image, potentially hundreds or thousands of images within a very short amount of time. And that novelty overstimulates the brain. Dopamine, which is known as the gimme, gimme, gimme molecule or the mm -hmm. I gotta have it chemical, right. Um, that's released in the brain when there is any kind of craving or desire from me wanting to go see my favorite uh, movie that's coming out or me having a date with my wife or thinking of Christmas morning. When I think about those things, dopamine is released in the brain. With pornography, because it's um, uh, sexual and because of the novelty, dopamine is released, but it's released in way too high uh, of an amount that our brain is used to. When our brain gets overstimulated from the dopamine, we build up a tolerance and we need more and more to satisfy us less and less. And it creates a, a vicious cycle of craving where we're always hungry but never full. Mm. There are two things that I love about this book, Michael. One is that you get into the brain science. Yeah. And number two, that you're willing to take this whole issue of sexual addiction and put it out there publicly. Um, what my experience in the church, and I'm sure you've experienced this, is that in the evangelical movement, we're uncomfortable with both. We're uncomfortable with the brain science. We're uncomfortable with exposing light in a public forum on sexual addiction. I wonder, um, you know, I didn't send you this question beforehand, but surely you've dealt with this. I, I wonder if you could speak to that. Why are we so uncomfortable about, about these two areas, uh, speaking about sexuality in a public forum, and then this thing of you know, brain science just kind of makes us nervous? Well, I think, I think the question about uh, speaking about sexuality in a public forum, I think it goes right back to Genesis 3, mm. when it says, before the fall, that the man and the woman were naked and unashamed. Yeah. And then afterwards, they cover themselves with fig leaves. God did not tell them to do that. God didn't say your body parts are bad, you need to cover up. Adam and Eve decided to do that because their genitals represented something truer about the deepest part of who they were as a man and a woman. Then God shows up saying, where are you? And they run into the trees and they hide. And so we have a tendency in our, in our fallenness to self-protect through, uh, through hiding, through covering up, through performance. And in the case of sexuality, I think it's something that too often is just too close to home, yeah. and there's too much shame involved, and so we don't talk about it. And by and large, the Christian church has not done well uh, speaking about sexuality in a way that's rich and meaningful yeah. and substantive. We either, we either say, don't do it, and just stop, or we ignore the issue. Uh, regarding the brain, I think it's uh, it's just right now a lack of information, and in probably more conservative fundamentalist circles, anything where science is put near alongside scripture or held up as a greater truth, that can be really intimidating to people, but that's really not the case. The Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, yeah. and the idea of the soul is the whole person. And so uh, I think we need to learn more and more about the brain and how that affects our behavior. I'm curious about a theory that, that I have, or maybe a hunch, I don't know if it's a, well, it's a theory of mine, that is this, that I think that we need to revisit issues of general revelation and special revelation, and, and I'd be curious to hear your feedback here, because I think that we have so emphasized special revelation in the mm -hmm. evangelical movement, and rightfully so, that the reason we know about salvation through Jesus Christ is through special revelation, but we have so emphasized that that we've relegated general revelation to the point where we don't recognize it as revelation. And mm. when I say revelation, mm. it is the exposing of, the revealing of God. And to me, science is that general revelation. It is, it is an additional voice yeah. that speaks to the reality of God. Just curious what you think about that. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think that although... Uh, empiricism and science uh, cannot be our ultimate way of experiencing truth. I think that it can certainly confirm and point us to truth and the very nature of God. God loves material. Mm. God is passionate about 
matter. And, mm. uh, and therefore, wouldn't he use science and medicine yeah. and PET scanners and MRIs and things like that to help his kingdom come? When we pray, thy will be done and thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, I think that includes uh, physicians that are, that are helping people to become well and yep. scientists that are helping us learn about the brain. Yeah. Uh, one of the books that I'm reading right now is called Switch On Your Brain by Dr. Caroline Leaf, and, and she talks about this in depth and actually uses some of the scriptures. It talks about um, you know, ca- you know, taking every thought captive and uses that, hey, this is not just a spiritual thing. But this is a physical thing, a scientific thing um, that we do. Uh, let me ask you real quick. You, you talked about the brain being overstimulated. And I'm, and I'm just curious, when you're working with somebody, what are some of the, the physical, scientific things you do to help somebody who's, I mean, and you go into detail in your book, that their brain is physically out of whack. How do you kind of get them moving back toward the right place? Well, if you remember in the movie Ghostbusters, when Bill Murray hooks people up to wires, we don't do anything like that. I right, right. I was getting excited. Yeah, yeah. But, Matthew. Okay. Oh, what? <laughs> Where is this going? <laughs> you know, it, it, sounds, it sounds very scientific, but when you're sitting in a counseling or a pastoral ministry room, it actually doesn't look that way at all. And uh, we have a, a, a three- or four-stage process, depending on who I'm working with, and the the first thing is to reboot, just like you'd reboot a computer, right. where you shut it down and it resets itself. And in order for the brain to be rewired, uh, you've got to reboot. And so you've got to stop any kind of acting out behavior. And so mm-hmm. we're really talking about after years and years of masturbation or years and years of pornography use or some other kind of sexual um, sin, the brain develops a highway where there's a path of least resistance. And you can imagine walking from a condominium at the beach out to the water, and between the condominium and the water, there is uh, chest-high seagrass, and it's very, very thick. The first time you walk through that grass, hopefully you won't step on any sea turtles, Mm -hmm. but as you're walking through that grass, you've got to really strain to press it down. Every single time you walk back and forth on that path, it's going to get easier and easier, and eventually that grass is going to get trampled down. So all of our behavior creates highways where the grass is trampled down. And in the case of an addiction or uh, a compulsion, the grass can grow back Mm. so that when we don't want to give into a certain behavior, that there's more resistance and we don't act uh, reflexively. Wow. So the first part is rebooting, and that's getting people to abstain from viewing pornography and masturbation, and they do that for 90 days. And people listening might go, well, thanks a lot. I've tried that you know, dozens or hundreds of times before, which was my story. And what's different is that when you're rebooting for the purpose of rewiring, it's no longer a moral issue. Mm-hmm. It's no longer about saying, oh, I'm going to do this because... I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. It's about more of a medical brain issue. And it's not unlike if a doctor said to someone, you know, your cholesterol level is at 400 and you're going to have a stroke unless you lose 25 pounds and stop eating cheeseburgers every day. You're going to be pretty motivated to go out and change your diet Mm, and lose some weight. And so it, it allows people to step out underneath the shame of there's something morally, spiritually wrong with me, and it gives them something to focus on that uh, literally to imagine their brain um, literally being rewired and reset. Michael, there might be someone listening or watching, and they, would, and they haven't read your book, and they would say to themselves, well, you know, Michael doesn't know the depths of you know, what I've done. Uh, you know, I'm not asking you to unpack every lurid detail that you unpack in the book, but maybe give some of our viewers um, some of the depths of, of where this took you. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I'm speaking not only as a, a counselor, minister, and spiritual director, and an author, but I'm speaking as a man who from the age of four, I was exposed to pornography, um, became really addicted to pornography around the age of eight to ten, became uh, a Christian in a pretty dramatic conversion at the age of 16 and thought, wow, this is going to be out of my life now. I've got God. And it only got worse. And 
until the age of 29, that addiction escalated from pornography to uh, strip clubs, prostitutes, acting out, escort services, uh, promiscuity, all in a double life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I've gone about as uh, deep and dark into sexual addiction as anyone might imagine. And I, I literally thought at one point this was just going to be my lot in life. And mm -hmm. I had to live with this duality and this never-ending shame, which ate away at me from the inside. And in ministry, it seemed as if there was this double bind of there was really no one that I could uh, talk to about it. Yeah. So um, there is hope. There really yeah, is hope. There is. Yeah. Um, you talk about, um, you, you mentioned the word shame a few minutes ago, and you talk about in the book the difference between shame and guilt. And we, just share some of your thoughts uh, about that with our listeners. Yeah, this is so important, Heath, because... Uh, oftentimes churches, if they're not careful, they can use a shame-based way of motivating people or uh, a shame-based form of obedience or shame-based theology. And in a nutshell, the difference between shame and guilt, guilt has to do with something you do, and shame has to do with more with who you are. So typically I'll say, guilt says, I have done something bad, and shame says, I am bad. Or guilt says, I've done something wrong and shame says, I am wrong. Mm. And shame speaks to a deep personal flaw uh, that we perceive to be in us, and it relates to a deep sense of unworthiness. One of the reasons why I'm really passionate about this is not just because shame fuels addictions, but because there's a lot of really weird theology over the fact that, pe as I talk about this, people go, well, aren't we worthless? And aren't we deeply flawed? Isn't that what sin is? Mm. And I think that... Uh, that, that this conversation opens up really healthy discussion about what the nature of sin is, and that that's very different than the imago day inside of us, where we have an inherent value, yeah. where God said, to, God said to David, for example, uh, I'm the lifter of your head, which is to say, I lift your shame, and I bestow glory and honor upon you. Wow. Oh, my, a, yeah, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, th This is so good. You're making such great distinctions here. There was a part yeah. of this book that jumped out to me. It's a quote, and it's a Nowen quote, a Henry Nowen quote, but, and, and it goes right along. I want to get this. I don't want us to miss it. Uh, Nowen says this, self-rejection is the greatest enemy of the spiritual life because it contradicts the sacred voice that calls us the beloved. Being the beloved expresses the core truth of our existence. We had a professor on, um, I don't know, about a year ago, Dr. Joe Donjil, and he was talking about the supremacy of love in the life of the believer, and he w mentioned John Wesley, and he said in that passage where we're called to um, love others as we love, to, well, to love God and to love others as we love ourselves, he said, Wesley astutely picked up, there are three people that need to be loved here. It's God, it's others, and it's ourself, and Wesley's contention is it's pretty hard for us to really love our neighbor if we're not happy with ourselves. Right, right. Yeah, and, and, and how can we be happy with ourselves unless we fundamentally understand that God's heart is for us, that God is not mad at us, that God is yeah, yeah. perhaps disciplinary but not punishing, that Christ said, it is finished, which means that all the wrath that ever needed to come toward us or anyone went upon Jesus. So, yeah, I, I, I get really passionate about this. Another, another quote from the book, and I, I think this is profound, Andy Comiskey said that shame is like a raincoat over the soul that repels the living water of Jesus. Ah. And so if that raincoat is over our soul, it's generally some sense in which I don't like myself, <laughs> I reject myself, I hate myself, and, uh, and when that's removed, then God's love can get in and my love can get out. And back to what Heath said about taking thoughts captive and how Dr. Leaf has written on this, and she's one of the earlier Christians to start writing in depth about uh, neurology and the brain and behavior. I, I believe that the, the previous verse to that taking thoughts captive, I believe it's in 2 Corinthians uh, 10, 3 through 6, it talks about demolishing strongholds. Mm. And it's interesting that most people think of the word stronghold as some kind of spooky, hocus-pocus thing. But it defines a stronghold as a belief or a lie that stands in the way of the knowledge of God. So a person who believes that they're worthless or that they're fundamentally unlovable or flawed 
that's a lie that stands in the way of knowledge of God. Mm. Not only are we to take that captive, but we're supposed to demolish wow. that stronghold. That's good and, uh, and science is starting to lead us in the direction of those strongholds are not just invisible demonic things, but neurological structures yeah. that are in place that all of the good effort in the world to overcome a sin is not going to overcome. Mm. Yeah, it, there's some great research being done right yeah. now on plasticity of the brain. I think in the pre-show we were talking with you about yeah. some of Norman Deutsch's stuff. I know that you've read that. A um, couple other things I just want to reference. Um, we did a whole episode where we talked about shame, and so if, if our listeners or viewers are tuning in, T.G., what episode Yeah, was Dr. That? Dennis Humphrey is a great episode, 192. Episode 192, titled, We Are Not Ashamed of This Episode. <laughs> uh, also, too, one of those voices of general revelation out there. Now, this person's not a believer, but Brene Brown has done some great research on the issue of shame. Michael, I see you shaking your head there. Are you familiar with her research? Yeah, when I, when I have people uh, come and do soul care intensives here in Colorado with Restoring the Soul, one of the first things I do is I give them her two CD set. Uh, men, women, and worthiness, and it's just profound. I, I, I think it is, it's, it's more biblical than, than yes. most of oh, most Michael. Of the yes. sermons that you hear on this. And then, and then you hear her kind of cuss and say Jesus' name in vain and things like that. And, and I mean, I grew up with swearing like punctuation in an Irish <laughs> Catholic family, so I wasn't, I wasn't bothered by that. But uh, you know, she, she just walks this line yes. of being very prophetic. There's a whole realm of, uh, of secular prophetic thought uh, that I've, I've come up with that title. When the Lord says the rocks will cry out, mm. I think we oftentimes think of this apocalyptic end wow. times thing where it's literally the rocks. But what I, what I think God is saying is I can even use inanimate objects and I will use unbelievers and I will use That's science it. to cry yeah. out my glory yeah. and to cry out my truth. And that's how committed God is to binding up broken hearts, setting captives free, which is the necessary ingredient for us to live in a kingdom come, thy will be done kind of way. Yeah, I, I'm so much, uh, I, I have not even read Brene Brown's book, but I have, I've seen different talks that she's done. I did a spiritual formation class, and this was for credentialing, for ordination just last month, and I, pre I played her initial um, TED talk. It's about a 20-minute video, and I, you know, I had to say to my students, you know, for those of you that are offended by bad language, just put on your filter, please, because uh, mm. I, I love I love your phrase here that it's you know it, it's prophetic talk because w when I listen to her and as she unpacks it, I say to myself, "Oh my word, this is revelation." I mean, mm -hmm. I can tie this in with the scriptures over and over and over again, and I and I simply say, she whether she even recognizes it or not, she is a vo uh, a voice. For the reality of of the of the creation that God has created, yeah, right. I, and I think uh, just let me throw this out as food for thought. I think that Christians are afraid of what she calls empathy. You know, she says that the antidote to shame is empathy. I would say that the antidote to shame is being the beloved or living in the love of God. And, and I think that we're honestly sometimes afraid to believe that the gospel is that good, yeah. <laughs> that we can live wow. naked and unashamed. And pastor after pastor, missionary after missionary that we work with here at Restoring the Soul, they say, why doesn't everybody know about this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, until you've been broken or fail or hit some kind of wall in your life, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's only then that this kind of truth can, can fall in. There was once a a student that asked a rabbi, why does Holy Torah tell us to place the words of Scripture upon our heart? Why does it not tell us to put it in our heart? And the rabbi responded, it tells us to put it on our heart because we have to live life until our heart breaks. And when our heart breaks, then the words fall in. Wow. And so I, I think that we need yeah, to be preaching and teaching and discipling in a way where we're helping people realize the brokenness that's already there and then in that brokenness to allow truth to really be penetrating and transformative. Now and pornography. Go ahead. Pornography, it, 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 the only reason I talk about pornography and sex addiction, it's not my real passion, but it's an opportunity to talk about all this other stuff when people are so open. Yeah. yeah. Um, another place where this book sings, at least in my opinion, is you make a link concerning sexuality and spirituality. Talk about that. 
Yeah, uh, many of your listeners will be familiar with the quote that's attributed to G.K. Chesterton, yeah. who said that the, the man who knocks on the brothel door is knocking for God. And uh, Philip Yancey has, has written a good deal on that quote. And as I first heard that, I thought, gosh, if that's really true, then what if, what if men surfing the Internet were surfing for God, like the man knocking on the brothel door was knocking for God? Mm. And what are the implications of that? What that means is that underneath uh, this very wrong, destructive, sinful behavior, that there's actually a legitimate God-given appetite yeah. that we're longing for intimacy, for connection, for transcendence, uh, for comfort, for nurture. And as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians uh, 6 about sexuality, and as he does in 7 as well, Eugene Peterson translates in the message, he says, sex is more than mere skin on skin. It's as much spiritual mystery as physical fact. Yeah. And so there's, there's really something beyond the physical that we're searching for, that we're seeking, that ultimately pornography and sexual sin can never satisfy. Yeah, so good. Um, before we let you go, Michael, is there anything about the book that we haven't touched on that you just want to kind of share with our viewers um, uh, before we let you go? Yeah, thank you for that opportunity. Uh, I, I want to quote uh, Bonhoeffer, interestingly, who said that the pursuit of purity is not about the suppression of lust, but about the reorientation of our life to a larger goal. Wow. And Christians, by and large, try to deal with lust and sexual sin by the Nike mentality of just, just do it, just say no, and just use your willpower. But really, to overcome these things at a deep level, we need to come to terms with our brokenness. And in the book, I, I talk about brokenness with five W's. Wickedness is sin, and that's where we most of the time stop. We just say, well, it's sinful, stop it. But Heath, you talked about the importance of neurology and the brain. And so the second W is wiring. We are mm. neurological beings, yeah. and our wiring is broken. The next one is woundedness, how we are sinned against, how we have wounds in our heart that bring up the question of, is God really trustworthy, and is intimacy and relationships really a good thing? Another W is weakness, which are limitations and vulnerabilities. Most of us come into life with our gifts and our talents, and we hold those out front, and we put our weaknesses behind us. And what happens yeah. at that moment is we become a poser or a false self, and then we can never really be loved for who we really are. So this theology that Paul says of boasting in our weakness or in our being strong in our weakness, there's really more to that uh, than simply getting through suffering. There's a theology of weakness and brokenness that we need to embrace. And then lastly, warfare, the lies and accusations that come at us through life. So wickedness, woundedness, weakness, warfare, and wiring. And I believe that to experience the deepest level of transformation and wholeness, that as Christians we need to understand a person, the image of God, this glorious ruin is Francis Schaeffer said, through all five of those lenses of brokenness. Wow. You know, Michael, when you was reading that list there, it, it just reminds me of something that we have talked about on this show repeatedly, and that is that it is very easy within the church to become a poser. You would think that in the community of God's people, that this is the place where I can really be myself. I can pull back the curtain and say, this is who I am, here are my weaknesses, here are my strengths. Mm. And and that doesn't happen. I you know, I always I ask this question to so many of our guests, and so I'm just asking asking your opinion, why does it seem like, at least in my anecdotal experience, that the church is the last place where we have that really um you know real experience with people? Well, it's always easy to point the finger at others, right? And so it, it really start, starts with me. Um, and it starts with you, but I think it comes down to the fact that we don't believe that we are loved. We simply don't believe that we're loved, which mm. is really the heart and soul and core of the gospel. All right, well, Michael, before we let you go, um, you know, I'm sure that uh, our talk has piqued interest with some people. Where can our listeners find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Michael J. Q at Michael J. Cusick. You can check out my website for our ministry where we care for leaders and the organizations where they serve at restoringthesoul.com. And then you can check out surfingforgodbook.com. All right. Well, listen, we love the book. We love are it. certainly going to be cheerleaders for it. And yeah. uh, I'm going to thank you in advance for resources that uh, you send us. And we'll be sure to give those away at the first part of 2014. 
Awesome. Thanks so much, guys, for having me. Hey, thank you. All right, blessings on you. All right, um, again, we're giving away two copies, Kindle editions of Surfing for God today. Um, one more time, maybe tell our listeners what they need to do. Yeah, all you have to do if you're in the chat room is just tell us. Tell us that you want to win a free book, and we will get you entered. And toward the end of the show, before we do the giveaway, uh, we'll put the link in the chat room, and you can see if you have been entered so far. Let me check here. We've got... Four entries, so gotta, chances are whoa, good. Oh, wow, man. Um, yeah, awesome book. Way uh, more people than four in the chat room, which yeah, is interesting to me. Yeah, what are you so people doing? What are, what are y'all you doing? doing? You're in the it. chat room. I know well, a couple of them have already read the book and have the book, but hey, you can Let give it, it. Give us an email address to somebody you want yes, us to Yes, we'll spam them. <laughs> 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 hey, uh, Matthew, I noticed that you put Brene Brown's... Um, you embed no, it in our show notes. We'll have it in the show in our, in our show notes when they're posted. I've got links okay. to both Dennis Humphrey's episode on shame, which you'll find, if my memory serves me correctly, correlates very well yes. to yes. what's being discussed today yeah. and was one of my favorite episodes of all time right. in that it's just things that I'd never considered before and getting to know Michael and hearing him talk about shame. Yeah. Fantastic. So go back and listen to that, and then there will be a link to that TED Talk on yeah. shame from Brene and, Brown. And I want to say it with Brene Brown, as there are going to be a couple times there where she curses, so put your filter on. And I'm going to be really hard to say that, you know, I know many believers who don't have any trouble sitting down watching a movie where there's objectionable language. So um, you watch something with objectionable language that is redemptive. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I just want to say this, and and you know, I, again, I I am doing so much research now on neuroscience, and I firmly believe that the pastors, churches, and denominations that get this. Yeah. Oh man. Let me t- because neuroscience is such it's a, such a new science. It is such it is so new. But the ones that get it are going to be able to help people in a way that that others that have that mentality of, well, you just got to do it. You're just not strong yeah, enough. Yeah. I mean, I was talking to a guy the other night who's discipling a, a new Christian one-on-one, and he's talking about how frustrating he is. He's like, man, he just doesn't get it. There, It's like there's something wrong with his brain. And I'm like, oh, well, there well yeah. 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 So I'm telling and it's you. it's not an excuse. No, not, no, it's absolutely not, not. It is absolutely to say not. by the power and the grace of God, especially with accountability, bringing people in our lives, yes. we can change patterns of behavior. Yes, Yes, and I would yeah. I would definitely point you to uh, Michael's book, but also RestoringTheSoul dot com. A lot of great resources there, and uh, what he's oh, just great, yeah. great book, great, great guest, good book, uh, highly recommend it. All right, let's keep rolling on here. Time for yeah, yeah. <laughs> download of the week. Wow, I just did I just did some sort of gymnastic move. You to broke your arm. That. It was you broke your arm getting over there. It was a, Incredible. Yeah. Uh, now, we didn't hear it here, but I assume that's because the speaker was there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Everybody else. All right. So our download of the week, I'm just, I, I pre-made a video for you. This is my big cinematic, um, you know, uh, whatever you want to call it. Okay. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Bum, bum. This week's download is Handy by Flora. Right now, I'm at YouTube, and I'm playing the video of a recipe. If you've ever tried to follow a recipe on YouTube, one of the challenges can be starting stopping your video because your hands can often be dirty because of food preparation. Well, Handy by Flora seeks to bring a solution to that. So you go up to YouTube and you copy the URL and then go to Handy's webpage, handybyflora.com, and just paste that link in the box where they tell you to. And now notice when I hit play now, it's going to ask for access to your webcam. So there it was just briefly. Again, it will show up in the right-hand corner as you're facing the computer. You have to do that because what Handy allows you to do is control that YouTube video now with gestures. Above my head, this little yellow box is where you do all your gestures. So by sweeping to the right, I start the video. I'll let this run for a few seconds so I can demonstrate a couple of other things. You need to know that this is a Chrome browser based only. It doesn't work in other web browsers and it is in conjunction with YouTube. So if you try to go to another website and copy the URL and play a video here from another website, it's not going to work. It only works with YouTube. 
Also, it does not work with iOS devices, your iPhone or your iPad, and I assume the same is true with Android devices. The company says this is something they're working on right now. They're working on iOS devices to bring it to the iPad and the iPhone. All right, this has been playing for a little while, so let's say for whatever reason I want to pause this video. I can sweep to the left, and maybe the reason I paused it is I want to rewind. And so by sweeping to the left again, it will rewind 10 seconds. Now, just now, that was really fast. I've had some times where the response was great. Other times, it lagged just a little bit. So let's say I want to go further back in the video. I'll try it here a second time. And there, you know, that was pretty, it was pretty quick as well. So I might be at the point here where I want to start playing again. I just go back and do the right hand sweep. And now the video is playing again. Um, I haven't tried this in real life, but I've had those moments when I have been following a recipe on YouTube and I've had that problem where my hands were dirty and it was a hassle. So the next time I'll certainly try this. If this is something that you try and you like it, why not let Handy by Flora know it and just give them a big thanks for um, providing this as a service. All right. Well, during that little demonstration, there was some late breaking news. Yes. I think. Yes. What, what we got here, T? We have confirmed that the cat litter genie was purchased by Pris Priscilla Hammond. So. Yeah. 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 Wait, wait Thank you, Priscilla. Friend of the Thank show. You. Thank you for your support. Let me, let, hold on a second. Let me look up the. Uh, let me look up the actual amount that we earned off of that cat litter genie. I think <coughs> that that's that's important for us to note. Why here. are you doing that? Can I just say that this. It, this handy app is the Jedi mind trick. Yes. <laughs> I love it. That's true. Jedi mind That's trick. Uh, 58 cents. 58 cents. 58 cents. That's right. Listen, yes. we, we do appreciate it. I mean, seriously, every penny that we're making through this thing. I, I, <laughs> it adds I, up, man. I mean, I didn't think. I think, I think Matthew's the one that started taking us down this trail. And it yeah. really is beginning to give us some, yeah. you know, we're building up a little money so to work every, with. Every time you take out the cat litter, Priscilla, you can just remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Those cats are a blessing. My liposuction fund continues to grow. <laughs> oh, my word. Please oh. don't say that. <laughs> Every, oh, but I do, now, Heath, I do like that. The, the, yeah. <laughs> this is not the recipe. I, I do not want to watch this video. I was though. actually very impressed by uh, Handy by Flora. I mean, it really was. It was nice and responsive. And I have had those times my hands were nasty and trying to wipe them and pause the video. So the next now time you, I... You told us uh, last week when we were talking about this as a download of the week potential that they're wanting to make iPad and tablet apps. They're working on this. it right now. Yeah. That's where it would be beneficial for me because a lot of times I'm using the iPad I to do follow too, recipe. man. Recipes, I, yeah. I will use that thing in the kitchen yeah. like yeah. crazy. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, time for They Said It. Oh, goodness. Read my lips. I'm going to say this again. I've never taken steroids or HGH. I took the initiative in creating the internet. The Macintosh of all the machines I've ever seen it is the only one that meets that standard. I'm not a crook. If you if you know what you're doing here, slide slide out. Across the world, people are being singled out and hounded out simply for the faith they hold. Middle Eastern Christians are rooted in their societies, adopting and even shaping local customs. Yet a mass exodus is taking place on a biblical scale. In some places there is real danger that Christianity will become extinct. Muslim Baroness Shaidi Warsi, a Brit born of Pakistani parents. Warsi understands better than most the cost to the Middle East if Christians flee. Source USA Today. We mark out opposition to this extension and expression and express our trepidation in the face of the risk of growing trivialization of such a grave reality. Leaders of Belgium's Christian, Muslim, and Jewish communities, after the upper house of Parliament, Parliament voted by a large majority to extend to minors a 2002 law legalizing the practice of euthanasia. Source, the New York Times. All I can share is that there is an evangelical celebrity machine that is more powerful than anyone realizes. You may not go against up against the machine. That is all. Mark Driscoll clearly plagiarized, and those who could have underscored the seriousness of it and demanded accountability did not. That is the reality of the evangelical industrial complex. Ingrid Schuletter, 
a part-time topic producer for the Janet Mefford Show, who recently resigned over the Mark Driscoll plagiarism controversy, Source Pathios. Just seven years ago, if someone had told me that I'd be writing for Christianity Today magazine about how I came to believe in God, I would have laughed out loud. If there was one thing in which I was completely secure, it was that I would never adhere to any religion, especially to evangelical Christianity, which I held in particular contempt. Christine Powers, in an article where she describes her journey from atheism to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Powers is a political pundit and columnist who currently serves as a contributor to USA Today, a columnist to Newsweek and the Daily Beast, and a political analyst for the Fox News cable channel. Source, Christianity Today. Hey, before, before you get into it, I didn't realize that this was even out there, but another purchase that could have been a great purchase of the week. Somebody bought a full body wetsuit <laughs> using our link. Oh man. Okay, sorry. Back to you yeah, guys. Th- thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 the squirrel thing. Oh, there's a nut <laughs> over there. Look at over there. Oh my goodness. <laughs> a full body wetsuit. <laughs> Listen, TG, leave the ADD attacks to me. <laughs> All right, let's just stop at the top here. Start at the yes. top. This USA Today article. Um, this is written by a guy named Kenneth Starr. <laughs> yes, you may have heard of him. <laughs> yeah, you may have heard of him. Um, and there might be some who are younger. My, my kids would have no idea who Kenneth Starr is. All yeah. right, Matthew no doesn't idea. either. Nope. So um, you, Kenneth Starr kind of went after Clinton uh, over his um, dis- indiscretions well, with Monica he, Lewinsky. He was the he was the he was the special prosecutor. It's not like he just woke up one morning for impeachment. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, but he is now a college president. He was speaking at a commencement and. This article is worth the reading because what he gets into is you have a Muslim who in Great Britain is standing up saying what is happening in the Middle East is not good. So even this Muslim is saying that Christians have contributed to the culture in ways that are beneficial. And his point is this, beneficial in the way that Christianity has been beneficial to the United States and in many ways the place where people around the world want to come. So issues of freedom yeah how many times when steve stanley was still on the show we would say in in the church we have this idea that democracy is great democracy is great or in america excuse me right but what underpins that democracy yeah what value system what philosophies here you have a muslim who's saying it's not good what's happening yeah. in these countries so yeah. and i i don't know but like you can draw parallels all the way back to the old testament can't you with with the whole thing about us turning democracy into a religion the hebrew people they did not want to live in a theocracy they're like no a, a, a king is good a king is good we need that's what we need yeah. we need a king we need a king and finally god says okay have a king and it was it was a massive failure, failure i mean there were yeah. some great kings there were some great kings and right. some great periods of time but overall um that's not what's to be worshiped and strived for yeah what's right what's yeah what's it broke be? god's heart yeah He's like, I'm not enough for you. And he is so powerful, you know, there. In, uh, but, but, I mean, yeah. um, what, what is your point here? Your point is that God um, gives them the freedom to make choice. He, he does, but, like, I'm just going back to, to our previous discussions about, about democracy is not the answer oh, for, yeah. for every problem in the same way that, for them, a theocracy yeah. was certainly not the answer for their problems yeah. as people. They... Yeah, they they sought after something that they thought yeah, they I'm wanted that in the end wasn't wasn't yep. the greatest, and it's this, we just do the same thing. So I mean, it's just history repeating itself. It's this whole theory of of um, are things as bad or worse today than they ever have been, and that all that. Yeah, you know, Warsi when she her comments are certainly related to contemporary situations in yeah. Egypt right now. Yeah. The Muslim Brotherhood is working hard to just and Christians are leaving. Um, On oh, Iraq is especially Iraq, right? Syria, uh, Syria. Those are the three countries yeah. that are mentioned in this article. Um, highly recommend its reading, um, and of course we recommend it because we agree with it. How about that? Right, right, <laughs> um, right. We don't always do that, but um, the the next <laughs> article here. Um, so now they've extended euthanasia to youth. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, in Asia? <laughs> no, I confused me as a in child. Asia. I got to I gotta be honest, youth in Asia, I remember hearing, because that was when I was a very young person, 
Dr. Kevorkian and all that stuff yeah. was going on. And it was a big discussion around me. And I had no idea what all the adults were talking about. Euthanasia. Yeah. yeah. What euthanasia. country is that? Where is like, that on the yeah. globe? We can't stand for euthanasia. <laughs> Why would you do that to those poor youth in Asia? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are we it going always, to war with man, them? It always messed me up. Um, What's great about this story is you have... Christians, Muslims, and Jews yeah. all on the same page on this about the value of, of life. Yeah, it's the religious communities that are saying, this is not good. And understand this. This is now children and youth who can say, I want to die. That is my choice. It is to die. The, I want to be fair to the legislation. It says in terminally ill cases. Right. Um, and yet for these Christian, Muslim, and Jewish leaders, part of their concern is... It's the slippery slope argument. Where yeah. does this stop? How we decide? Um, they in this article, you will find that they actually give you the number of um, people who have legally asked to uh, be euthanized since 2002. And I would say that I'm I'm with all these leaders. It's a concern of mine to yeah. to extend this to children and youth. I, I could at least make this argument that an adult. Um, Hopefully, is at a point in their life where they can understand the gravity of this decision. Right. Um, do children and youth grasp it? Do they understand it? No, uh, yeah. yeah. And I, I don't think that they do from just a, a maturation point, a developmental point. Okay, so this story, the next one here, um, Paul Tillman actually sent it, shot us an email last week wanting to know if we were going to cover it. I wasn't up to speed on yeah, it. We, and, yeah. And so, TG, TG and I had, had read a little you, bit about it. You guys knew about it. I didn't. It was the Driscoll plagiarism thing. And so I went to, I don't know how it's pronounced, Pathos or Pathos. Um, yeah. And so I started with all the posts from November the 30th. A couple things I would say, and then you can, whatever you want to yeah. say here, Heath. Um, number one, no question in my mind, but what he plagiarized. There, uh, he, he has just lifted some of D.A. Carson stuff right out of the commentary, put it in his book without citation. Um, the second thing I would say is it's not a surprise to me that this is such a big deal and it's causing such a hornet's nest. And I think it goes back to this principle that mm -hmm. Jesus talks about in the Gospels. And it's that passage where he says, judge not that you be not judged, because in the same measure that you would judge other people, then that's right. going to be divvied back to you. Yes. Driscoll has not been afraid to be a lightning rod. We covered him two months ago where he goes to John MacArthur's right. conference unannounced with his own books because he disagrees with MacArthur. Right. So it, it, it makes perfect sense to me that people are coming back on him yeah. because he's been tough on people, and yeah. so now he's getting some of that same treatment back. So I have yeah. the clip from the radio program. How it's long is it? Two minutes. Oh, If you want to hear, like hear, hear, hear how she addresses it. Heath, you've heard it one time. I know where I'm going way off script here. Yeah. Now, this was actually not released by her people. This was released by Tyndall, uh, Driscoll's publisher, because live... We'll play it, and then we'll, we'll explain yeah, play what it. we... We're probably going to run a little long today, so right, hang with us. Listeners. Oh, but it's worth it. With John MacArthur and went to a footnote... It, you can 14 determine... pages, 14 pages of no footnote and no page citation. No, there's a, there's a footnote that says that it comes from Peter Jones' works. It says, see for example. It doesn't have anything... And he has a website and a think tank and classes at Westminster. His whole life has been dedicated to the issue of, you know, monism or oneism. Right, right. Well, I just think if he is such a good friend, and I think that, that that's great that you guys are great friends, I think that you should have given him the credit. I think that's what a friend should do. And I... This is my point, Mark. We can have sound doctrine all day long, but if we don't act in a godly way, who's going to listen? That's and that exactly applies to pastors. What I'm saying. That's right. Exactly and I mean, but that applies to me as a regular sheep, and it applies to you as a pastor. But you're more than a regular sheep. You're a, you've got a large audience, and the Bible says not many should presume to be teachers, and you've got a lot of people listening to you who are learning from you. Well, I'm not teaching. I tend to interview people and take calls, but a uh, fair point that, you know, you're certainly entitled to think that. I think you are on the right track as far as saying we need to do something about this culture, and I think that you are right in saying something's wrong. But I think that it's important when you're getting those ideas out that you do it in an upstanding way. And I, I really hope that you, you are going to fix this because I think it's the right thing to do, and I think it would be a good witness for everybody who's going to read and, uh, you know, look at the ideas in your book. 
All right. I think we've lost him. That is Mark Driscoll from Mars Hill Church in Seattle, and I guess uh, he has opted out of the no, interview. I'm, I'm still here. I'm just listening to the I'm... Janet Mufford Show, and we'll be coming back. Janet, if you're still there, he's Wow. So so what happened is live on the air, it appeared that Mark Driscoll had hung up. Right. So this was released by Tyndall Publishers to show, no, 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 this is the raw audio that he had not, that Mark Driscoll had not hung up. So it goes back to my point. Now, here here's my thing. Uh, plagiarism or not, I don't want to get into that. But the fact that uh, Janet Medford, Medford on her website put up all the proof, if you will. Yeah. The the facts. And you can still find that at Pathos. Right. Pathos. Within a few days, it was gone. Compl- her website right. completely whitewashed. One of her major sponsors, one of the major supporters of her show, Tyndall Publishers. Yeah. The same publishers that publish, if I'm not mistaken, Driscoll's books. So... Here's here's my issue, okay? And I don't care if it's plagiarism or whatever. Ingrid's point that there is an evangelical celebrity machine, uh, I think she's absolutely yeah, right. I yeah, think she's, she's resigned right over this. She yeah. sees it as an issue of justice and that yeah. there was there was a moment. It was and the moment was this for the evangelical world and for Tyndall to do the right thing and to say to him, this is clear plagiarism, yeah. fix it, and that Tyndall and the evangelical world blinked because... And she, didn't, she didn't, like... I don't feel like in the way that she addressed it that, that she was, like... Now, there was more that happened before that, so I haven't heard the whole thing, but mm-hmm. I don't feel like she was overly, like, crazy about it, and I don't think she was coming... Like, he's been on her show before, is my understanding, and yes. she's not coming at it as, like, a ha-ha, caught you. You know, look no. at that. It's like... And you, know, you you claim to be a, a a friend or really love these ideas. It'd be nice to actually have proper citation right. for and 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 it was very clear. Hey, we're bringing you on the show, and it was not a hit piece. He was what made aware ahead of time. Right. These are the things we're going to talk about. Well, here's another thing too. If you go to his website. Mm-hmm. They are very clear about you will not plagiarize Driscoll's stuff. If you use it, you will give him credit. So his website is very hard on that. Do not plagiarize nope. me. Let yeah. me go down another little avenue here. This, the, the weight of responsibility doesn't just fall on him. It also falls on his editors and the publisher. Oh, good. Right. And, good. Uh, and I think that that, so this doesn't extend to just if this is Tyndale and they're putting their name on what Yeah, and he's we should doing, say I don't know that it's Tyndale. Well, I can so check. let's yeah, thank you for I'm, saying I that. I think it is, but okay. uh, look at look it up real yeah, quick. Man, he's looking he, it up. Yeah, yeah because um, it will be your response. We whoever, have the internet and we can we can look thank it up. You. <laughs> it is, it is Tyndale. Okay. All right. So so what that should do in the mind of the reader is say what about the other things that I'm reading yeah, that are oh, published good. by yeah. Tyndale? Uh, yeah. because yeah, again, I I could make like let's say it's a let's say it's an honest mistake. Now she's pointed out multiple instances, not just in one book. But let's say that it's a that it's a legitimate mistake. Oops, that's a boo boo. Man, their editors have got to get on the ball on this. Yeah. What is happening here? One of the other points that was brought up in one of the articles I read is, and don't, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but these guys don't write all their books. They right. have no. You, they have researchers. This is they have theory that it's a ghost. They have researchers. They have ghost writers. Right. And these people are not given full credit in in a lot of Driscoll's works. Yeah. You got some college student researcher ghostwriter who's that's one of the theories. Who's probably that, getting that paid. Driscoll or, has put his name on this, but he didn't produce it. And that you know he he kind of generally. But well, that no, is just a. I mean, I that, can I can tell you that a lot of a lot of his stuff has come out of series that they've done. And you can say this. You can say the exact same thing for a Tim Keller. Keller, yeah. A lot of a lot of the stuff. A lot of the stuff that people put <clears throat> out come from something that they, as a team of people, yeah, have put together to. at their church. And oh, now, yeah. at the end of it, when it gets published, it gets the name of the pastor, whoever that that front yeah. man is. Yeah. So I, it's a tough one. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, it is right. It, 
And, and it's not to say that stuff that Driscoll's written in the past is bad. It is just it is just a point of accountability. And when you look at, when they put those two things side by side, D.A. Carson's writings and his, oh my word. I mean, yeah. clearly it's it's it comes from Carson. You couldn't have just and it's, stumbled on this It's the opportunity that, that, what's her name in the in the radio interview is right. Janet. She, yeah, you need to go back. And just say, yeah, let's make it right. How simple a solution? I like agree. it's a simple solution. You're right. Yeah. Didn't notice that, or didn't do our, didn't do what we needed to do. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. We're going to make sure that that footnote is changed. I mean, how hard it, was and, that? And and this is such a big story. And I am probably the rare person who is. Oh, you're rare. <laughs> I'm very I'm very in the gray when it comes to Driscoll because most of the time you either love him or you don't love him. Yeah. Not in a biblical sense, but you well, know he's what been I mean. a lightning rod. This is why I say I started out by saying I'm not surprised there's this kind of reaction because he hasn't been afraid to be out there right. and really tough on things. Yeah, and I mean, let's again continue to cut the guy a break. Um, he in his in his time as pastor, we've seen the most unchurched area of our country lose that prestigious title. Um, yeah, good point. <laughs> So good, point. good gracious, yeah. the man's been hugely effective. Mm-hmm. I mean, at one time we said the Northwest, right? That yes. that area, oh, it was. the most yeah. unchurched, and they have yeah. lost that title to the Northeast now, haven't they? I, I, I don't my know. Understanding, I, according I don't know. to, to it's the not a title right? you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, real fast here, the last story. Not going to get into it. If you want just a refreshing story, Christine Powers goes from atheism, comes from an affluent family, highly educated family. Um, she was very uh, much into the Clinton administration, worked for the Clinton administration, is a Democrat even to this day, but is now a believer. And she goes to Tim Keller's church. Yeah. Um, and it was through their ministry that she came to believe. Fox did a story on this, so you can see the video. Also, you can read the Christianity Today article. And um, I'm going to offend someone by saying this, but she busts the myth that one um, cannot be Democrat and an evangelical Christian. And I think that she has nice. something to say um, yeah. in, in that area. And can I just say, and I, I don't think I've tried to hide this, but I, I do watch um, Fox News more than any other news. Okay, cut thing. his camera. Uh, <laughs> and I will, Shut the man down. I will say oh, this, oh, there you go. go. Okay, cut, <laughs> cut. I will say this, as, as you know, I, and I'm not uh, sure how long she has been on Fox News, but I can tell... I can tell a difference in her. When she is on there now, since her conversion, there there is um, there's there's a not there's an edge missing that used to be there, and so uh, when I when I read this yeah. when this article came out, I was like, huh, because I had noticed that in watching. I said something's different about her. I, I didn't know what it was. I'll tell you what where, where the story is going to press you is. Keller is able to minister to her and that church because they are reaching out to the intellectuals. Right. And what she could not deny were some of the arguments that he was putting out there and in his message. She said every message tied back into Christ. And she said, I love the messages. I just wish he'd stop tying back into Christ. And then she comes to this epiphany. I mean, the Holy Spirit just reveals uh, himself to her. And it's like, oh, my word, this is true. This is the reality of the universe. Well, well, well worth the the watch and the listen. All right. Um, as Matthew's already alluded to, this is going to be our last broadcast for 2013. So let me just uh, say to Matthew, to Heath, thanks, guys, for a, a great year. Has been um, a great year. Real quick, any special Christmas plans here? Or? Um, I, I'm going to the Orange Bowl. Pretty happy about that. Pretty excited. Whoa. It's going to be go great. Buckeyes. I mean Clemson. <laughs> no, it's going to be it's going to be great. So very very excited and and Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, yeah. Seasons Greetings yeah. to to you too as well. Happy Festivus. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Matthew. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing too special. I'm just researching follow up on on that story. Uh, giveaways. Yes. In the chat room. You want to talk about those? Yep. Okay. So I've run the randomizer generator. Yes. And it picked. Are we giving away one or two? We're two. giving away two. Two. It picked the last two entries <laughs> no of way. the day. So you got in late, but it's good wow. for you. Priscilla Hammond and Richard Hall. 
send us an email address where you would like a Kindle version yeah. of that book to go. You can send that to the technology show.com. If, if you have it and you want to give it as a gift to someone, then just yeah. send us the email to the yeah. person where you want it sent. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yep. All right. Um, for 2014, uh, let me just let you know what our calendar is going to be initially. We will have a podcast on January the 7th, but then on January the 14th, we have no podcast. We are going to be out of studio. We have our minister's conference, our pastor's gathering here in South Carolina, but we will be back on January the 21st and going to have a great friend of the show as our guest, Keith Drury, going to talk to us about two of his books, Soul Shaper and Gather. Um, if you have been with us for a while, you know that Keith helped us out at General Conference, which yeah. is which is really cool. And we'll be showing a highlight reel of his best comments from <laughs> yeah. from that. Are Are you putting that highlight reel together? <laughs> no. no, I think I think I know I know we're not supposed to bet, but I think we should bet on what kind of facial hair he may Ooh. have. Like I always like he had for a while like a Quaker beard. Yes, yeah, and sometimes yeah. it changes up so. I'm saying he's going to be clean shaven for episode. I'm just going out there. I put myself out there right I'm now. I'm betting on a turtleneck. <laughs> <laughs> what does that do with the his facial hair? My man? mind is so weird. Because all his. Well, never mind. <laughs> I love him. Love him. All right. So uh, can, let me just say to, to all of our listeners, those of you that support us, those of you that are using our affiliate link, thank you so much. You have made this a great year for us. Um, we're excited about what we've done in this year, but we're even more excited about what is before us. Uh, continue to help us get the word out. Um, you can find Heath, Matthew, myself, all of us on Twitter, Facebook. We wish you a very Merry Christmas and a most prosperous New Year. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Eddie, if I woke up in the morning with my head sewed to the carpet, I wouldn't be any more surprised than I am right now. What? <laughs> what? Oh, they mean? know. <laughs> they know. The people know. The people know.